Hello everyone. We're about ready to start talking about one of the most important systems in quantum mechanics, and that's called the quantum harmonic oscillator. The quantum harmonic oscillator, well, we know what a classical harmonic oscillator is, right? It's a mass attached to a spring. So the spring has spring constant k, some mass attached here. Maybe this is the equilibrium position. And then the mass will oscillate back and forth. That's a classical harmonic oscillator. And we know that the potential energy of the oscillator, V of x, is 1 half kx squared. It's the elastic potential energy. Spring has spring constant k here. And x is the distance the oscillator has been stretched from its equilibrium position. The frequency of this oscillation, the angular frequency omega, is the square root of k over m. So you can solve this in favor of k, k is equal to m omega squared, and you can substitute that in here and write it as 1 half m omega squared x squared. If I were to graph this potential, it would look something like this, and it would be a quadratic. Classically, if I had a particle in this potential, it would oscillate back and forth between a and minus a. a is the amplitude, so this object would oscillate back and forth, which corresponds to the oscillation of this spring. If we want to do the quantum mechanical version of this system, we should solve the Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, h hat psi is equal to e times psi. And h hat will be my kinetic energy p hat squared over 2m, plus my potential energy, which is now this, 1 half m omega squared x squared. So that's what we're after. We want to know what are the allowed energies for a quantum particle experiencing this potential, sort of a spring-like force that that particle is feeling. Uh, we want to know what are the wave functions that describe a particle in this potential. And normally what you would do is you would try to solve this differential equation for the wave function. But there's a really cool trick for finding the energy levels and the wave functions in this system where you don't have to solve any differential equation at all or a very simple one. And in order to exploit that trick, we need to learn some more math, which is, has to do with operators. And that's why the title of this lecture is Commutators and Ladder Operators. We're going to learn some mathematics needed in order to solve this equation in a very tricky, um, slick way. Let me remind you of some of the operators we've learned so far. x hat, so the hat is the operator. And an operator is just a set of instructions. So x hat is just simple. It just means multiply by x. So x hat acting on some function just means multiply that function by x. And we've also learned the momentum operator p hat minus i h bar d by dx. So that means take the derivative with respect to x and then multiply by minus i h bar. Those are the ones that we've learned so far. And we've seen that the order matters when it comes to operators because for, at least for these two operators, it matters because of this derivative. So as an example, let's say you have some function f of x is equal to, let's say, x squared. What is x hat p hat f of x? That would be x minus i h bar d by dx of x squared substituting in what is f of x, I get minus i h bar x times 2x, which is minus 2i h bar x squared. But if I did this in the opposite order, if I did p hat x hat f of x, then the p hat is telling me to take the derivative of everything to the right. So i h bar d by dx of x times f of x, which is x cubed. So I get minus 3i h bar x squared. And you can see that those are not the same. So the order of operation of, of the multiplication by x and the derivative matters. So we say that x and p do not commute, which is just another way of saying that the order matters. Regular numbers commute. If we take, for example, 3 times 2, that's equal to 2 times 3. It doesn't matter the order in which you do that. That's commutative. M multiplication is commutative. 
Some operators commute. For example, you can consider an operator like y hat means multiply by y. Then x hat y hat on some function f of x and y would be equal to y hat x hat some function of x and y because the multiplication commutes. So we would say that x and x hat and y hat commute with each other. But not all operators commute, as we saw with x and p. Those did not commute. The order did, in fact, matter. So some operators commute with each other and others don't. And it's important to know which ones commute with each other and which ones don't. We can determine whether operators commute with each other or not by evaluating what's called the commutator. So there's some notation for you. Suppose I have two operators, a hat and b hat. This is equal to, by definition, this is the definition of this symbol, a hat b hat minus b hat a hat. So square brackets, a hat comma b hat is called the commutator of those two operators, a hat b hat minus b hat a hat. This is kind of a weird expression. It's kind of like these ones up here. What I should understand is this is an identity between operators. The left side is an operator, and the right side is an op operator. So it's weird when you have operators which aren't attached to anything when you're just getting started using this notation. Remember that you should insert some kind of test function here, meaning that these operators are going to act on some function. And that just means that that's a hat, b hat acting on this function, minus b hat a hat acting on the function. Okay, so if you have an operator and you're confused about it just sitting there alone, put some function next to it so that it has something to act on. If the two operators commute, a hat, b hat minus b hat a hat would be 0. So this would be equal to 0 if the operators commute. And it's not equal to 0 if the operators don't commute. So let's evaluate some, they're called the canonical com commutation relations for those two operators we know. Okay, so what is the commutator xx? So what does that mean? It means if it's acting on some function, f, it's going to be x hat x hat acting on the function minus x hat x hat acting on the function. So writing them in reverse order, which is obviously 0. This is true for any function, so that x hat x hat is equal to 0. An operator always commutes with itself. And for the same reason, operator commutes with itself, p hat p hat will also be equal to 0. The more interesting one is x hat p hat. So remember, this is going to act on some function f. So that's x hat p hat acting on the function minus p hat x hat acting on the function. And the function could be a function of x. So what is this going to be? This is going to be x hat minus i h bar d by dx of f minus i h bar d by dx of x times f. All right, both terms have an ih bar. The first term is minus x f prime of x. The second term comes with a positive sign because I have two minuses. When I do the product rule here, I get two terms. I get f of x plus x f prime of x. And these cancel, and I get ih bar. So what we showed is that the commutator x and p acting on some function f is i h bar times f. This is true for any function, right? We showed that x hat p hat acting on some function f is i h bar times that function f. True for any function. So we can express the operator identity down here. I'll just write it as x hat p hat is equal to i h bar. And this has a connection to the uncertainty principle, which we'll come back to.
Basically, I can't know both the position and the momentum at the same time because of this uh, commutator. I want to introduce these things called ladder operators. Recall, like, the application we have in mind is the quantum harmonic oscillator. So I'm going to introduce these two operators. And for now, it's just coming out of nowhere. It seems like a definition. We'll explain why they're useful a little bit later on. So first one I'm going to call a hat plus. And then I'm going to call something a hat minus. It looks very similar. This is called raising operator. And this is called a lowering operator. And we will learn why they have these names a little bit later in the course. OK, so I've just defined these two operators for you in terms of position and momentum. My question to you before I dive into it is, do these operators, do you think they're going to commute with each other? So does the order matter? Putting it another way, if I were to calculate a hat minus a hat plus, do you think the answer would be 0 or non-zero? If you think the, these two commute with each other, you'd put a zero here. If not, there would be something else here. So go ahead and pause the video. Think about that. See if you can, in your mind, decide whether you think these two things are going to commute or they aren't going to commute. OK, so have you made your prediction? Each of these has a p hat and an x hat in them. And so when I multiply a hat plus and a hat minus, I'm going to end up with terms which have x and p both in opposite order. Because they each have x and p, and x and p don't commute according to this, these two things are not going to commute with each other. And we want to know exactly what goes on the right-hand side here. So that's what we're going to be after, is figuring out what is the commutator a hat minus a hat plus. Before we get to that, let's spend a little time getting practice working with commutators. So for example, what if what is a hat plus b hat commutator of that with c hat? So we know how this works. Basically, I write the first thing, a hat plus b hat, and then the second thing, which is c hat, and then I subtract the two in the opposite order. So now I can distribute the c through, remember to preserve the order. So a hat c hat plus b hat c hat, keeping the c hat always to the right on that first term. And then the second term, I'm keeping the c hat always to the left. Let me just rewrite this in a different order. So I'm just grouping terms together. What we have here is the commutator of a and c. So this is a hat c hat. And what we have here is the commutator of b and c, b hat. So if you have a sum inside of a commutator, you basically just do the commutator of the first two plus the commutator of the second two. Now what we're eventually trying to do is a hat plus a hat minus, and there's a sum in this term and a sum in this term. So let's build up from here and try to do one that's a little more complicated. What if I have something like this, a hat plus b hat, c hat plus d hat? Well, we just learned that if I have a sum here and something here, I basically do the commutator of this with this and the commutator of this with this. So I can write this out. This would look something like this, a hat, c hat plus d hat. And then I would have another commutator, which is b hat, c hat plus d hat. But then I have the same kind of situation. Now I've got a sum in this term and a sum in this term. So you can kind of guess what's going to happen here, is I'm going to have four commutators. So basically, I just do all possible, all four combinations, commutator of these two, these two, these two, and these two. All right, so with this in mind, let's go back to our ladder operators and try to evaluate the commutator of those ladder operators. We're interested in this commutator, a hat minus, a hat plus, the lowering operator, commutator with the raising operator. So these are constants. The constants can come outside, because the constants, I don't have to worry about the order. So I can bring this constant out in front, and I can bring this constant out in front. So I get i times minus i is 1. And then I have uh, the square root, two factors of that square root, 2m omega h bar. 
And we just learned that if I have something like this, I have to take all possible, all four possible commutators. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So p hat, p hat. And then I've got this one plus i m omega p hat x hat. Right? Keeping the order, the p hats on the left, the x hats on the right. Now I've got one here, minus i m omega x hat p hat. So the x is on the left, the p is on the right. And then I've got i times minus i is 1, m squared omega squared x hat x hat. OK, operators commute with themselves. So this one is 0, and this one is 0. x hat p hat was i h bar. p hat x hat, that's the commutator in the opposite order. So you have to think about what does that mean, a hat b hat is equal to minus b hat a hat. So this will be equal to minus i h bar. So what do I have all together? OK, i times minus i is 1, m omega h bar. And over here I've got minus i times i is 1, m omega h bar. So on the top, I've got 2 m omega h bar. And on the bottom, I've got 2 m omega h bar. And finally, at the end of the day, the answer is just 1. Because I know how x and p commute with each other, or don't commute with each other, any operators composed of x and p, I can figure out those commutation relations as well. And these raising and lowering operators have this very simple commutator, a hat minus a hat plus is equal to 1. All right, so just to summarize, we're working towards the quantum harmonic oscillator, which has this potential v of x is 1 half m omega squared x squared, quadratic potential. I'm telling you that we can actually solve the Schrodinger equation very simply using operator techniques. And we're learning some of the math for that. So we learned the commutator between two operators tells us whether the order matters for those two operators. We applied that to the position and momentum operators, x hat, p hat, and found that they don't commute. So the commutator of those two operators is i h bar. I introduced the raising operator and the lowering operator, which are combinations of p hat and x hat, and found that those also do not commute because they depend on p and x. So a minus a hat minus a hat plus is equal to 1. So we're going to apply these techniques now to the quantum harmonic oscillator to determine the energy levels and the wave functions in a very cool and tricky way. If you found this content helpful, like and subscribe. Thanks very much.